Hi, I'm Rod. Um, I'm Yu Peng from Uber, and very happy to be here today uh, to join this community and then see so many familiar faces. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about um, a topic around like how do we backfill up the table uh, with uh, um, uh, a fling Pinot connector that we at Uber contributed to uh, Pinot um, last year, and we'll also talk about like you know if upstairs is something new to you. I also talk about something uh, around like how we build upstairs and why we build it. Um, about myself, um, I'm a Yu Peng Fu. I'm a principal engineer at Uber. Uh, I lead the real-time data infrastructure uh, at Uber, uh, which is built on top of many open source technologies, like for example, Kafka, Flink, Pinot. Uh, we also use Lucene for our search engine as well. Um, I'm a Pinot committer, so uh, I made several contributions, including absurd. Um, all right, so we'll talk about like real-time antics at Uber in general, and then we'll give an overview of absurd itself, and then I'll talk about like why uh, backfill is a challenging problem and how we solve it. Uh, perhaps this also, if I use absurd, you may run into this challenge as well uh, in other places. And then I will quickly go over like uh, the some technical details about this Flink Pinot connector, and then I will conclude with some future work like we are planning, not only limited to about like absurd and uh, backfill, but some other interesting stuff. Okay, cool. Um, so, you know, like Uber by nature is business is really about like real time data, right? So real time antics uh, is quite something powerful, and we like bet heavily uh, uh, inside Uber. So we try to categorize the use cases within Uber in three groups. The first about like real-time actionable insights. So on the left, you can see there's a dashboard which is we build for all the restaurant owners across the globe. Um, so that like the restaurant owners can go there and see how their restaurant perform like over the day. Uh, and if you look at some of these uh, uh, like uh, parts in this diagram, like for example, like ongoing missing orders or any uh, actionable like orders that demands like some immediate action uh, to the restaurant owners. So this is a power about real time and actionable insights, so that uh, our end customers can take actions and see what's going on with them, right? So uh, and uh, you know that's the we try to provide like the real-time insights to our Uber end customer, not only about the employees or ops within the, within the company. Uh, the second group is, uh, is about like time-sensitive decisions. And my favorite example is uh, something in the middle, which is uh, demand supply management, which is one of the core functionality um, of Uber. So if you take, like say, a Uber ride, or you order order from Uber Eats, uh, like, uh, a lot of like logic is built around how we can fulfill the customer's order. Uh, it is actually a quite challenging problem because it's really a dynamic like a uh, space. There are like every minute there are like tens of thousands of orders coming in, and we have uh, carriers or drivers all around the globe at different like geo locations to fulfill these orders. So how we can dispatch these orders uh, in a real time fashion? And also, we, we want to optimize for like good user experience, and also want to optimize for like you know the revenue like for Uber uh, from the business perspective. So this is a quite complex um, like algorithm like we build inside Uber, and the real time analytics takes a big part inside of this. Uh, that we provide real time signals so that algorithms can act on this signal. And then make a time sensitive like decisions. Um, so in the past, we also have some other talks like have some certain deep dive on how we build the, you know, the dynamic pricing or the real time, uh, like decision making over the fulfillment. But you know, this is a kind of like area that is very interesting and why quite unique, I would say, like to the Uber as a business. And lastly, uh, RTS also quite important to grow the, our user engagement. So on the right hand side, you see there's a, like a carrier like scorecard, which is we built for our freight carriers. Uh, this is actually a pretty cool story. 
So before, uh, before the free team launched this feature, uh, the, uh, we received like uh, challenges from the, our free carriers that you know, they deliver the good and to the end customers, and, but you know, the, some of the feedback were not like in time, and that kind of upset both customers and the free carriers. So we try to provide some like real-time feedback to users to see how they perform in the middle of, the, of, the, of their way or on the road, they can see their real-time information um, so that they can take actions accordingly, and then we can have users very engaged with us. Uh, and after, after we launched this feature, uh, we have seen you know, the improvements across almost all the metrics uh, around like user satisfaction, uh, around like how the, the time like we delivered the uh, the shipment, so everything got improved, which is which is great. Um, so our mission at Uber around this RTA is like we want to provide fast access to fresh data uh, at scale, right? So you can see these three keywords are recaptures like what we do um, at Uber and I give some additional more information about like how we can achieve and the big part is that the core technology we build on top of which is Pnode is a very good fit uh, for this kind of like requirements. So today RTA or the, the platform like internally we call it like uh, EVA which is the code name for our platform. It's kind of the one of the cornerstone for the Uber technology. And this is a cloud of words. You can see all our internal like, use cases and customers, they build solutions on top of this platform, like from you know, our end user facing applications like Uber Eats uh, to you know, Uber's uh, like uh, the metric system, like U-Metric, uh, to the machine learning -like platform like Michelangelo, which is our like internal like ML platform, uh, too many, many other things, right? So it covers almost every single business line like inside Uber and uh, we bet like heavily on, on this platform. Um, so as you can see, this is kind of very, very high level uh, architecture of our platform. And you can see in the center, which is the core, is the, is the Pnode, which is the storage engine and the query engine, but we, do not stop here. We actually build like surrounding components around it, um, and try to solve different kind of like uh, problems uh, that improve the operation, improve the user engagement, uh, make our user life much easier. Uh, for example, we build a, a self-serve ingestion um, like um, um, uh, like component to. Uh, allow people to build Pino tables, set up ingestion pipeline from Kafka and from HDFS uh, without engaging, you know, the Pino team at all. So it's like a, we call this like a, you know, zero contact, right? So um, it's like everything is built self-serve. Uh, so it's like actually there's a UI called like UWork, uh, which is also Uber built internally for the workflow management. So it's scope not only limit to build RTA workflows, but many, many other workflows. Um, so we incorporate this uh, connector into that platform. Um, so user can go to a UI, then click a few buttons, configure something, and then boom, it's like we kind of set up like Pino table, which is right away uh, can be used for serving. And on the query side, uh, we build this Pino and Presto connector, and we also contribute this to the open source community as well. Um, so, you know, internally, many of our users and engineers, uh, they are familiar with the Presto. And also, we position Presto as Uber's internal query federation uh, engine, um, so that people use Presto query not only about like Pinot, but also Hive, MySQL, and many other things, um, so that we try to uh, double down on one like uh, language flavor, and also use one dialect to query all kinds of data within Uber. So, uh, and then we have our BI component, which can create like charts, uh, build a dashboard like Grafana uh, over uh, this kind of like query engine. Um, so, you know, this is a, a critical platform that Uber, so, and we label the services by its tier. So tier zero basically is like the most critical piece that if it's down, the Uber is done. So this has been a tier zero service with a four nights uptime. And um, another thing to call is about, uh, I mentioned like fresh data, 
um, like and a fast query, right? So here, uh, our ICA for data freshness is like is like seconds. So within seconds, data is produced to Kafka. The data will be available for in Pinot to for people to query, and this is critical for uh, a large category of use cases. I mentioned that you know there are certain time sensitive decisions like the fulfillments, right? So the data has to be fresh so that actions or the decisions are made are uh, like in time enough for the for the users. And the latency is also uh, pretty good. So you know, for the majority of the queries, like P99, most of our queries can finish within 100 milliseconds. So that uh, requires a lot of work on how we can operate uh, this system and then you know, provide optimization uh, in a like uh, well the the uh, in the way that do not require too much input from users. So we put a lot of learnings uh, in this blog. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to and read how we can operate Apache Pinot and Uber at scale. Um, then now let's move on to talk about like absurd particularly. So uh, why why absurd? Why want to build this feature? So the story started from about like two years ago. Uh, at Uber, we found out that like uh, there are like a good number of use cases that we require data that can be updated or corrected, but still we need to give like accurate view or updated view. Like for example, like like uh, we have this live dashboard that our ops can see um, how many ongoing orders and uh, what their status. Right? For example, like there are several orders are created right now. And uh, some orders already uh, dispatched to the carriers, and some orders already delivered. So, with absurd, we can easily write a single SQL query on the left uh, to achieve this goal, right? But without absurd, it becomes much much harder uh, problem because the status can change over the time, and we have to like find complicated solution to surround this like problem, like. Uh, the core of the flux of problem is that like absurd is a certain function that you cannot find equivalent in SQL. It has to be something fundamental built into the storage system itself. Um, so we'll show some like one interesting case study on that the use case of this, uh, which is the Uber Ads platform. Uh, you know, over the past few years, one of the most fast-growing business at Uber is ads. And today, it generates like a billion dollar like revenue, and uh, you know the Pinot actually plays a big part inside of this, uh, because like ads is something uh, like uh, in real time that like uh, we want to give like fresh data um, to uh, the uh, system to add the real time signals. Uh, they actually a pretty cool uh, story on this. So initially, uh, the ads platform was built on top of some third party software. But that software, one, it takes like a, a good margin like from our revenue. And second, so that, that software uh, builds on top of like some stale data. So usually it's like it takes like half a day or a day to get data, right? So, and this is actually a blocker to certain critical features. Um, for example, in ads, there's a, some concept called like pacing uh, that with the, uh, you, you get the, we display the ads to end customers, and depends on how the user react to this ads, we can do the dynamic adjust, uh, adjustment to the ads display strategy. So that's why the real-time information is important uh, for the efficiency and also for the effectivity of the, of the ads that we display. Um, so this ads platform, they started like in the 2020 August, and then like within a year, that they were able to build this end-to-end -end solution, and importantly, provide like exactly once uh, semantics processing, uh, and, uh, and uh, why, why exactly once is important. Is that like uh, much of this like ice data used for um, like bidding, right? So we want to charge the advertiser, uh, and that means this data has to be accurate. Like we do not want like duplicates, uh, which means like we will overcharge. And we can now like afford data loss. That means we undercharge. Right? So, exactly once is something like really cool that uh, we build uh, based on the business needs. 
And there are like several components that we put together to make this happen. Like we, we made the, we leveraged the exactly ones like processing like in Flink, we use the transactions in Kafka. And then lastly, like we add the absurd into Pnode that we can make this end to end work. Uh, so you are interested can take a look at the blog that we published on how we achieve this end to end. And we have a link at the bottom. Um, and now we can talk about like how um, upsell works. Um, so for people who are like familiar with Pnode, we are going to a little bit of, uh, in the details about like the, the system internals. You know, like Pnode data is built on top of like segments. And segments you can think of as a chunk of data that like we ingest from Kafka or other streams. So, and as we, keep reading the data from the streaming source, at a certain point, uh, we will say, okay, there's enough data in memory, let's flush it. And then this flush data is a, is a segment. Uh, there are certain properties about these segments, which is why it's like they are immutable, uh, which is quite common to the real-time systems because uh, it's very friendly for high throughput uh, like data writes. And this is actually one of the reasons why Pino can not only ingest fast, but also it can query really fast, right? And second, like segments are distributed, um, which is can increase the parallelism of the query so that we can serve the query in the fast fashion. And lastly, segments are replicated this for higher availability so that we can have better tolerance to discover to the disasters or data loss. Um, so, but what, but the, by default, um, Pino try to distribute these segments in the way to better utilize the disk usage, right? So that means that the segments could be randomly assigned to different servers. So here I give you one example that we have four servers, S1, S2, S3, and S4, and they are like different segments. Um, so you can see Pino will try to uh, like distribute these segments in the way that uh, they are randomly picked on the servers. So that like, let's say one server is down, it's okay, you have replica on the other servers, right? Um, but this bring um, like a challenge uh, to the to the upsir, a problem like this, is that, um, so by upsir it means that um, I have a record, and then later I have a, some update on the same record. So there's actually a lineage uh, of that, there's some information that we want to track where are these uh, records, right? So here I gave you an example, let's say, um, there's like a, a primary key. Uh, and uh, that this primary key can show up in both segment one and later in segment two. Let's say the primary key is one. But now you see, oh, there's a problem that now this record uh, shows up on every single server. And then becomes a challenge, like how we can efficiently and quickly to locate these records so that we can do the upstairs like logic processing, right? Um, so uh, initially, um, like I think three or four years ago, there were some attempts that trying to uh, build like a global uh, like management, data, metadata management to track where are these like, uh, like records. But then that means you're going to solve a very difficult distributed system problem that you want to build like uh, like a consensus machine uh, to aggregate this global information. Um, so two years ago, we took a different approach and tried to solve this in a, a more distributed way. So um, as, we, as I said, like the, the key challenge is how we do the checking on the records of the same primary key. And we want to do a reduction of this problem to instead of a global coordination, we want to reduce it to a like local coordination problem. So the, the key insights is that uh, we want to partition this, this, uh, these segments based on the same partition key, uh, which is like Kafka supports or some other streaming system also supports. So that we can say for the same primary key, it will always go to the same set of servers. Then that means from the same server, you actually have the global view of all the records of this primary key, right? So this is actually a much, much easier problem. This becomes like a local problem. 
Um, so the trade-off we have to make is that like we need to add this partition or like grouping logic uh, in the like streaming processing phase, which is like before we produce the data to Kafka, which later ingest by Pnode, you should like partition this data accordingly so that when Pnode ingest this data, we can achieve this guarantee uh, of the about the locations. So this is the overall like architecture that when we uh, made this uh, like feature, we contributed to Pnode, is that like a Kafka coming in, let's add like a Flink processor, which is purely for partitioning, and then partition this uh, into uh, a different um, like partitions, and then subsequently the part the record same primary key go to each of these Pinot server. Uh, there are some internals about the Pinot server we have to tweak and change so that we have this uh, lineage information tracking and management. Uh, we call this uh, upstream metadata manager and also some coordinator. Um, but overall, as a user, you can think of like that the Pinot server enhanced to be able to do the upstream uh, on each single host. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty cool like story and then we build it and then we have really, really good adoption internally and uh, many use cases on board it. And then we found out like for some use cases, we encounter different type of interesting challenges. Some challenges around like that um, there's like too much memory consumption. And then we have a subsequent like work to add, for example, TTL uh, or harshing to, to solve those kind of challenges. Um, some other challenge is uh, around like, you know, better functionality of upstart itself, for example, partial upstart, right? So we also add those changes. So the backfield actually is a one group of challenges we found is very interesting and quite common we see at Uber. Um, so some background, like why we needed a backfield. Um, so, uh, so one is that in a real production, um, like bootstrapping is actually very, very common, right? So like usually like we have some existing business, like some existing like data set, and then the product team reach out and say, hey, we want to have a, some real-time like dashboard. I want to see the data for the past three months or past six months. So without bootstrapping, that means, yes, let's set up a solution for them, set up a Pinot server, and let's wait for ingestion. And three months later, yeah, it's ready. But, you know, uh, product team cannot wait for that long, right? So we want to bootstrap from existing data and then to populate the Pinot servers in a very uh, fast and efficient way. And there's also other category of requests coming from reprocessing. So uh, the product team experienced some certain bugs that they want to correct data. Like say yesterday, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., there was a bad code landed and then caused some issue. So we want to uh, delete these, those pieces of data and then like repopulate this data. Or there could be some certain computational logical change that we want to apply this to the historical data as well. So they are pretty frequent as around like how we can do efficient backfill. Uh, and this is actually a problem for upstart because one is upstart table is a real time time uh, a real time table only, and second it has a very strong dependency on Kafka, and third is that like you know for people who are familiar with Kafka is known for um, lower throughput than the batch bay. Uh, so if you for you know at Uber for example like we ingest Kafka into Hive and then we use a Hive to accumulate all the historical data. If you run the same logic uh, using Hive to over Hive and compare the same logic in Kafka, you really will see like an order of magnitude of difference. Meaning like it takes, for example, like one hour to process in Kafka, it may only take like one minute or so using Hive. Um, that's because for the batch data, like file based processing is much, much like uh, efficient and much higher throughput. So um, this actually uh, observation that we already made before we uh, solve this problem. And uh, in, we, saw, we try to solve the backfill problem for all the streaming use cases that Uber, uh, we call this a, like Kappa Plus approach. So there's actually a video at bottom which we gave to the 
uh, Flink Forward uh, Conference to the Flink community to talk about how we solve backfill in general uh, for, for Flink. Uh, the idea is uh, actually uh, quite intuitive. So you can think of like, hey, I have a Flink job. And in the streaming mode, it will process the Kafka topic as input and then do certain things and then populate to the output Kafka. But in the backfill mode, by inputting some like parameters or from config, instead I can read from the hype table, which is was ingested from the Kafka topic. And the user try to use the same Flink job processing logic, but this time the Flink job processing is actually batch oriented that can process this data and optionally output to either Kafka or a hype table. Uh, because every single hype table is just from Kafka, right? So there's actually a counterpart uh, of Kafka to every single hype table. So by going through this backfill route, like over the hype table, we usually see like 5x or 10x, um, like time saving. So, uh, and additionally, a really good thing is like we actually solve uh, a problem around productivity is that how we can use the same like logic and to process the, the data either in streaming mode or batch mode. Because commonly uh, in, the, in the companies, like people have to rewrite this logic for any batch oriented in Spark or in Hive query, and then you have duplicate logic in another language, which is not that um, uh, like friendly to the developers. That, and also it's those quite error prone, right? So we try to use the same processing logic um, and uh, those are some of the slides I copied from the talk we gave to the uh, Flink community to show how we do the backfill like at Uber. And importantly, uh, a nice thing about this is that we actually add the, the support to all kinds of like connectors or sync in Flink, like not only about Kafka, but also you know, JDBC, Cassandra. So all of this can seamlessly add the support to this batch oriented like processing. Um, and let's look at how we in the in this uh, um, penal case uh, for this particular um, like context of this setup. Um, so for the source part, we already have the logic that we can read from the hype table instead of Kafka. Uh, the challenge is like how we can push data into penal because if we're going through the Kafka, then we go into the same problem that Kafka become the bottleneck. So the idea is that we want to directly generate the penal segments within Flink, and so that we can upload these segments directly um, to the penal servers. Um, so that uh, requires some work of, like we need to build this Flink penal connector, which has more information in the next slide. Uh, but at very high level, you can see that uh, the Flink connector uh, try to reuse the, the segment generation and uh, uh, packaging logic from the, the penal servers. Um, so in the um, uh, open source that we extract those segment related logic into a library, now become like a common um, uh, SPI and then we build this connector uh, using those APIs. And now the, the logic of the code become much, much simpler, right? So if actually it's only a few lines of code, you can see that only thing we need to do to add the backfill support is to say, hey, we need to partition this, uh, um, this, uh, this uh, hype table using the same partitioning logic that how we partition the, the Kappa topics. And then after data is partitioned, we will add this uh, penal sync, and then it will populate the, the segments uh, into, uh, into the penal table. So this actually a penal connector um, that we put together and then contribute to the Flink community as well. It's under the free 166. Uh, so it's talk about the high level idea around like how we add a buffer into the uh, penal sync and then to generate the segment files and then tarp all the segment and for the upload. Uh, so keep in mind that like we're actually doing this, all of this in the batch oriented way, um, which means that the, we will run a Flink job um, as a batch job, uh, you know, similar to Spark, that there's a, like a start and there's an end of your data, and then 
uh, and then we do not support like checkpointing because there's a it's a, like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a batch job. Uh, and in fact, this actually um, on a direction that Flink community pushes a lot. It's called unification of streaming and the batch. Um, that they are a lot of like investment from the Flink, Flink community around like how we can make batch computation much much more efficient, much cheaper, and uh, they actually go to a certain extent that at the very low level implementation, there are different way to implement, and there are different like uh, like query plan optimizer and physical plan implementation uh, to make the the batch very efficient. So uh, this work actually also aligns with that direction, and then we leverage uh, the improvements from the Flink community as well. Um, yeah, our journey does not stop here, and there are actually several interesting work upcoming as well. So one is about the absurd TTL that uh, we already have like a PR in the Pinot repo that under review and the discussion. So the idea is that you know, absurd table takes a lot of memory use, and let's say we have a like absurd table for three months. Um, then it's going to cause a lot of memory like for those servers. But we have uh, some interesting uh, use cases that may not demand the absurd for that long range. For example, the data is like some user session. A uh, user session may only last about like at most a day. Then with this kind of like prior knowledge that we know, we only do do absurd for the past day, and uh, we can you know release the memory for any like data like it's longer than a day. So it's kind of like TTL on the primary key on our like map for the more efficient memory um, like management. Uh, in the same spirit that the like, upsell compaction is also something that there's actively uh, working on that you know uh, in Pnode um, upsell means that we'll invalid invalidate the previous records. Right. So that means let's say there are 10 records in the history, we will take the most recent one um, as the current value, and then we can safely ignore the previous one. But the penal table is mutable, right? So the, the those records still there. We just ignore them. But that's not very uh, efficient or, or not very uh, friendly for the resources. So the idea is to have like a minion, um, like uh, workers that can practically like uh, compact those segments so that we can safely delete those records. And we have some internal ex experiments that show like for some use cases, we can actually release more than 90% of the like memory and the storage after this compaction. Um, and similarly like for DDoop is another variant of absurd, uh, which is that like, um, so for absurd is like we will try to keep the last record, right? But for DDoop is that like, after I've seen the first record, I want to ignore all the subsequent records, right? So that is leverage very similar implementation of absurd, um, and uh, we're actually doing uh, also other work like on, on this. Um, and lastly, is about the Spark connector, which we have also received uh, requests from our internal use cases as well. Uh, first of all, I, we, we actually may improvement and contribute the Spark connector to Pnode. Uh, but here, the context is that we want to use Spark to do the backfill as well, right? So add the Flink connector and the Flink pipeline. But for certain use cases who are, uh, you know, for users who already have, uh, have Spark, uh, like workload, or they are like, the more familiar with the Spark logic, we also want to provide similar, um, like, Support so that people can run the Spark code and over the hype table and then generate like penal segments for the absurd. So, yeah, that's pretty much all my talk. Yeah, thanks everyone. Any any questions? Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question in your Kappa Plus slide. If you can go back. Mm. So you, uh, the, yeah, this one. So you you upload. Um, segments like real-time segments into the table so w what happens like is there like, going to be an overlap in time like how do you ups update the metadata 
because mm. it's an absurd table. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. That's that's a good question. So, um, so you know, unlike other real time tables, absurd table has a capability to handle duplicates, which is quite powerful, right? So it's done by the in memory metadata like management. Uh, so essentially, it's use a the a map data structure right. that for each primary key it will know which record is the the current one right so that means even in the case that you have duplicates let's say multiple segments and you have overlaps it's fine absurd using this data structure can correctly like identify the true record but again we want to be more like efficient um, so that the idea is that like uh, we use a segment like convention um, so that uh, you know if you have like offline like uh, penal table generation the segment follows certain kind of like convention right so the segment name has like the boundary like start time mm -hmm. and time so we try to reuse this kind of format so that next time let's say you you run the fling job a second time it will override or replace the segment from the previous run Right, so my question was about like the upsert metadata itself, like, mm -hmm. right, is it possible that when you backfill with the corrected segments, you could have new keys that are not there in the metadata? Uh, no, that's not, uh, that's not possible. So okay. the guarantee is provided by the upsert feature itself, actually not relevant to this one. Is that like, uh, we will like look at the segment and we will scan the, the table, the segments, and then we will load this data into memory. And importantly, for each record, there's actually a timestamp. Right, so do you reload all the segments after yes. you upload? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I yeah. think that was a missing point. Okay. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Um, thank you, um, great talk. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding, uh, can, can you deep break down into a use case, for example, um, now the upstream has a schema evolution, the schema changes, and now you need to do some backfill. Um, for example, using the historic data, how would you do that? Mm, yeah, so that's a quite good question. So, um, so let's um, break this down into two separate problems. One is the schema evolution, right? So um, there are like different handling of the schema evolution, including the um, upstream table as well. <clears throat> but this kind of applies to the time when you want to uh, have the schema change, right? So like from say time t onward, you change the schema, then for each newly ingested Kafka message, this can pop up into the into the segment. So for the historical like data, it really depends on that um, like what kind of like changes on this uh, schema change. Is it like removal of column or addition of column, or in fact like you have certain like breaking changes. Uh, I think the break schema breaking changes. That's actually much tougher to handle. And usually what we do is like, we have to recreate this table in this kind of cases. Uh, and this is why, you know, like backfill comes into the picture because when you recreate, there's a lot of data to process, right? So the way we do it is like, you have your current production table and you create a new one, which become like shadow one, and then we do the swap. We promote the shadow one into the primary and then we, you know, discard the, the old one. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question. Uh, so you, 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 you talked about the, the planning of uh, deduplication, mm -hmm. and, um, but you already support the primary key constraint. Mm -hmm. And why do you want to do that? Yeah, so the primary, uh, let's uh, look at this, uh, the diagram. I think the, first of all, there are like use cases that demand like dedupe. Right, which is similar to absurd, but not the same, right? So um, for those like D2 use cases, it's more because, you know, at Uber, like we, for Kafka will provide, uh, most of Kafka topic will provide at least one semantics. So naturally there will be like duplicates coming in, but we do not want this to um, like complicate or introduce incorrect results, right? So, so then how do we, like denote what, what is unique. We use a primary key to decide this is a duplicate record if they match 
the parameter key. This is our common definition. Um, and uh, people can choose how to compose this parameter key, for example. You can enumerate all the columns right, in this row and then put them all of them together as a key. Then that means like you want to dedupe everything. Or alternatively, you say, OK, I know what my table is. I know, let's say, there are three columns is sufficient to tell its uniqueness, right? So, but all of this boil down to at the implementation phase is that like we need to use a primary key to track and to remember this this primary key. So that means like we reuse some of the absurd uh, method management that we keep tracking all the primary key into this table, and then we just keep it there, and then this become like detector, right? So the next time a record coming in with the same key, you can just drop, right? So that's kind of the implementation we have. Hey, thanks for the talk, and thanks for contributing the feature to open source. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the scaling bottlenecks that you've seen with absurds, like do you see data skew um, mm. by primary key, and what is sort of the largest look back you have? Is yeah. it months or years? What's the order of that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Actually. That's one of the common questions for every new use case come to us. It's like, how do we do the capacity planning, right? So, um, so actually to help this, we actually build a tool and we contribute it to open source as well to, um, based on the samples on the cover topic. And then we can output a spec of like how much memory you need and how many servers you need. So the idea is that like, you know, we have uh, we can read the existing cover topic, and based on the, your primary key given and also the columns you want to retain, uh, that we can predict what's the shape this real time t subset table will be like. Uh, let's say you want to have retention of like six months. Then okay, this you need at least this much of memory, based on the existing like primary key collision and also the sampling results, uh, we will give this output so that we use this to do the server provision. Yeah, it's in open source. Yes. Hi, I was uh, curious about the schema evolution, the breaking change scenario you talked mm -hmm. about. Um, and you mentioned creating like a, a shadow table and swapping it out, if I understand correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, we were evaluating a, a similar solution, but ran into limitations where you can't rename uh, Pinot tables. Mm. Um, can you talk about your solution there and if you're able to achieve this sort of a table name swap without downtime to the Pinot table? Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So uh, I think for this, uh, so first of all, like we, try to have a certain conventions like internally and also like importantly that we um, we really discourage like breaking changes meaning that we, we only do this when we have to uh, and usually the, the the naming convention we recommend to our users more like you know in the industry there's like blue green concept right so you can label this like you know primary or passive, that's one way. The other way is like you can say, you, you alternate the names, the two name scheme, right? So, so that means you, always, you can always reserve a spot for the shadow one. Hi, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a uh, quick question on the, it sounds like the backfill for upstart table is actually, we're like backfilling the real time table, right? Is, mm. Am I understanding that yep. correctly? Okay, um, is there any plan to support Absurd within the offline table mm. semantic. Yeah, so yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, if you look at the backfill here, uh, you know the segments this table generates is actually uh, very similar to the offline segment, right? It just happens to be that it's put inside a real time table, and we actually change the real time table um, like implementation that can take the offline segments uh, as input, which is not okay for the normal real-time tables because real-time table use a Kafka message offset as a boundary, right? It has no denotion of like the time, right? So it was only let's say offset of A to B, this is the, this is the boundary. But here for the offline tables that we, when we generate, we use time as a boundary, 
So that means the upstream table, you actually have a mix. So for the real time ingest segments, it's have offset based. But for the offline one, uh, it's actually, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a time based. But this is okay for substrate table because we have the main data. That at record level, we can tell the duplicates or which one is new or SLIs that you have this time column associated with that. So that's how we can cheat the Pino to say, yeah, it's okay to mix this, but we can, we can figure it out. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, feel free to talk to me after this talk. Yeah. Thank you.